that audio? Nice. Hi, right, guys. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, very excited to be here. Oh, wow. I was supposed to be there. I'm supposed to be here. Yeah. So, I'm very excited to be here. I wasn't expecting to find that nice of a community here. I was uh, quite impressed uh, yesterday and the day before. Um, so, originally, the title of my talk was supposed to be Composing the Cloud 2.0. Um, so two and a half years ago, I gave a talk in Brazil to about 1,500 people where I explained, it was called Composing the Cloud. And on that talk, I explained uh, why you should use uh, microservices, uh, how you can leverage now to deploy microservices, like what microservices are, what are the benefits, how do you, how do you uh, why microservices, and so on. Uh, but last week, uh, I changed my mind a little bit. Uh, I thought instead of uh, explaining how you can use now, how you can leverage now, I thought I would explain how now works. Uh, what do we do? Like what's behind the scenes, right? So I removed the comma, the space, and the 2.0, and now I added an S, and that's uh, composed the clouds, like how we build our how we build our global CDN. Um, in case you don't know us, a uh, little bit of context: like we're the company behind now, the platform, which is a platform for ser uh, for serverless deployments. And we also have a bunch of other very popular uh, open source projects, like Next.js, uh, Hyper, Micro, and a lot of other stuff. Uh, and our main mission, like what we really strive for in the company, is to make the cloud accessible to everyone. Literally everyone in the, on Earth. Like, you know, we wanted to make as accessible as mobile compute, computing. Like Everybody has a, a phone in their pocket, so we want to make the cloud accessible to everyone as well. Uh, and when I mean accessible, I mean three main things. I mean they should be cheap. Uh, like if it's expensive, if it's expensive, we're not going to be able to empower people in Nigeria. Like there's a very strong uh, community growing a lot in Nigeria. We're not going to be able to empower students in India, right? Uh, it also needs to be easy to use. Uh, if it's not easy to use, like if you need to spend hours trying to figure the dashboard, or the API, or um, the CLI, if it's not easy to use, it's, it's not accessible. Uh, and, and I also mean that it should be fast. Like it should be fast, like really, really fast, very fast. It should be fast for ev for everyone, everywhere. Uh, uh, and one of the, one of the very um, one of the most simple ways that you can make your applications fast, like you just deploy it to close to very close where your users are, right? So if you have users in Asia. You deploy to Asia. If you have users in Europe, they deploy to, to Europe, right? Um, if you have users in Linz, you try to deploy to, uh, to Vienna if you can, or now you deploy like to Zurich, which is uh, the closest Google Cloud allocation, or deploy to Frankfurt, which is the closest AWS allocation. Um, however, until two weeks ago, we weren't really able to help you deploy to everywhere, right? Uh, as you can see on the map there. Uh, until two weeks ago, we only had four origin regions. We had San Francisco, Washington, Brussels, and Sao Paulo, and a bunch of other uh, DNS and ECAS nodes around. Right? I mean, that's not really any. That's not. That's not really everywhere. Right? It's like we're missing India, we're missing Africa, we're missing a lot. We're missing Asia. We're missing like five billion people. That's not everywhere. And that's what it looks like today, uh, just two weeks later. So we went from four origin nodes. Uh, where origin node is, an, is a, sorry, origin regions, where our origin region is a region where you can run lambda function, like you can host a lambda function there. So we went from four to fifteen, and we also added six uh, edge uh, regions. And by edge, I mean it's a region that can it cannot host a lambda function. For example, uh, you cannot host a lambda function in Zurich with us, but Zurich can invoke lambda functions in Frankfurt, for example, right? And you can also cache, serve and cache static files as well, and also serve uh, and also serve and cache uh, the responses from the lambdas that you deploy. Uh, right? Okay. Uh, so how how do you use that? Like, uh, how do you deploy to all these regions? Uh, how how do you do that? Right? Like, how do you use? How is it? What is the easy to use that I spoke before? So uh, to illustrate that, I'm going to show a, a simple example that we have. It's called Mono Repo, right? Um, it's a very simple. It's a very simple repo that has an API 
in the back end and the front end. Um, the API has four endpoints. Uh, one endpoint is written in Go. The other endpoint is written in Python. Uh, sorry, Node.js. The other endpoint is written in PHP, and the other in Python. Right? Uh, just four simple endpoints in four different languages. And then the front end is a very simple Next.js app, with, which one just one page and a few components. And if you see the middle there, if you see on the tree, there's also a now.json file, which is uh, how you configure now. But that file is also very simple. It has the name of the project, it's not repo. It has an alias, which is uh, how you instruct now, like where, where should it deploy, when you, when you choose to go to production, when you choose to deploy to production, where should it deploy? And I choose monorepo.mapios.sh. Uh, you choose the regions you want. Uh, you, have to, you, choose, you can choose among any of the origin regions you have. And there, just choose all of them. You just want to deploy everywhere. Then also have the version. It's just a version you further the file. And then uh, uh, the very important part is the builds. Like, uh, it's a very simple object. You just have to tell us like, um, how do we, which builder should we use for your files. So they are saying that for the package.json in the front end, you should use the next builder. For the Go files, use the Go builder. For the Node.js file, use the Node.js builder, and so on. And then to deploy, I basically uh, run now. Uh, I'm running entirely production there, but just to simplify the slides. So I just run now, right? Uh, in order, when I run now, a lot of things happen. Uh, the very first thing that happens is we SHA, we compute the SHA of all your files to see if we have them already. So in that case, I, uh, uh, I didn't upload any files because it already had all the files that my deployment contains, so no files had to be uploaded. And after that, we start deploying your app. Uh, we, we give you a URL already, a unique URL for that uh, deployment that never changes. And we start building it. So as you can see, we build like, the, again, we build the front end, Go, Python, Node.js, and PHP. Um, and then when the build, the build was done, it was deployed to all the 15 locations, to all the 15 regions we have, the origin regions. So now, uh, I have this very simple app that I built. I just wrote the code. I just wrote a simple, now, uh, a simple JSON file describing how now should build my code, where I should deploy to, where I should, uh, which domain should use, which alias should use. And I run now, and in 33 seconds, uh, I had my app deployed everywhere. Uh, I didn't have to worry. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot it works. So yeah, now if you go to the URL, I'm gonna show you that it works. Oh no, not Google. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you can see that it's a very simple app. It just shows you the time. Maybe let me zoom a little bit. Why not zoom? Okay. Um, yeah, so it just shows you the time, like it shows what the time is according to Go, according to Python, according to PHP, and according to Node.js. So every second evokes, uh, every second the front end evokes each of the APIs. Yeah. So um, I didn't have to worry about anything. Like, I didn't have to worry about building my code. Like, I didn't have to worry about uh, if Docker is working. Like I didn't have to worry about the Docker file. I didn't have to worry about Docker, multi-stage builds. I didn't have to worry about packaging my app, like deploying the app to all the regions I choose, not either executing it, neither scaling it, because Lambda functions just scale in a very simple way. They scale horizontally. So if you have one request, you're gonna have one instance of the Lambda. If you have a million requests, there's gonna, there's gonna be a million uh, instance of your Lambda. And it just scales horizontally automatically. I didn't have to worry about Jira beginning my app. I didn't have to worry, like, uh, I choose all these regions, and now I have to deploy my assets to all these regions. I have to configure them on all these regions. I didn't have to provision my SSL, uh, TSL certificates. I didn't have to renew as, uh, TSL certificates. I didn't rebind them. I didn't have to set up DNS records. I didn't have to set up geo proximity. Uh, if the user is in Linz, it should go to uh, Zurich. If the user is in Brussels, it should go to Brussels, right? It should be served by the, by the closest now location. I didn't have to worry about failover. Like, if Zurich is down, what do I do? Uh, how do I change the DNS records? How do I verify that uh, Zurich is up in the first place? I didn't have to worry about learning database dashboard, which can be quite challenging. I didn't have to worry about Google Cloud, about Azure, about anything. All I had to worry about was my code. Like, I wrote my code. I wrote a very simple file that describes how the code is built. I deployed it, and in 33 seconds, I have it deployed everywhere. Uh, however, 
there's no such thing as serverless, right? Uh, I didn't have to worry about any of these things, but somebody had. Somebody had to worry about Docker. Somebody had to update Run C when the CVE was announced a few a few weeks ago. Somebody had to upgrade Kubernetes. Somebody had to uh, uh, manage the Kubernetes clusters. And funny enough, that somebody happens to be me, so uh, I can I can tell you a little bit how we do it. Um, so how I, uh, as I showed in the map before, we have origin regions and edge regions, right? And they're both powered by Kubernetes. We, uh, each of them is a, a separate Kubernetes cluster. We don't do federation. We don't do any of that uh, messy stuff, in my opinion. We just run separate Kubernetes clusters. So can they be so, so they can be all uh, isolated from each other? And in both edge and, uh, and origin, we have a routing layer, right? Which is the layer that the end users interact with. Like when you're deploying to now, interact with the routing layer. You get routed to the routing layer. Uh, if you're an end user, like I, which I just accessed the deployment there, I also go to the routing layer. And it's a very simple, uh, uh, very simple design, honestly. It just has load balancers, proxies, a web application firewall. Um, and more importantly, the proxy is the one that talks to AWS Lambda. So uh, when I accessed the deployment there that showed the time, it was the proxy, it was our proxies that invoked the, the Lambda functions. Like they, they talked to AWS Lambda. Uh, and they also talked to the, the uh, object storage the guys we use to uh, S3, Google Storage, and so on to retrieve the static files. So that's the same for both. However, uh, the uh, origin regions also has our APIs, right? So a few selected origin regions have our APIs. Like the API for deployments, the API that manages the builds, the API that manages the files, user management, uh, team management, and uh, so on. And the edge regions, since they don't have the APIs, when they need to uh, serve uh, requests for APIs, they talk to the origin regions, to the closest origin region. So for example, our uh, Taipei region in Taiwan is a right edge region, so it uh, has to talk to Tokyo when it needs to serve a request through uh, our APIs. Uh, okay, uh, but uh, how do I, how does somebody have gets routed to those regions? Like when I'm here in Linz, uh, how does my computer know? How, how, like, how, do my, how does my computer know that it needs to go to uh, Zurich and not to SFO? Or how does it know that it has to go to Zurich instead of Tokyo, right? Uh, that's where uh, when our DNS comes to play. Like it, it sounds, it can, it sounds simple, but not really. Uh, so if we inspect the uh, name service that my domain is using, we're going to see that it's using obviously the uh, this IDNS, this iWord DNS, right? Um, and then if we uh, get the A record for my domain here from, uh, sorry. So now I'm, uh, I forgot about this part. So now I'm, in, I'm in a VM in London, right? So I'm inspecting the A records for my domain from a, a virtual machine in London. So you can see that it results to two IPs, right? And if we do a reverse DNS lookup for that IPs, for one of those IPs, we're gonna see that it's resolving to uh, uh, US West 2, which is a database location for London, right? And similarly, if we do the same, but from SFO, from San Francisco, we'll get two APs again, but they're different APs. If you compare them, they're uh, uh, different. And if we do a, uh, another uh, reverse DNS lookup, we see that it is resolving to AWS in uh, Northern California. Um, so how does that work? How does that part work? Uh, so when a user uh, let's say me sitting on my hotel in Linz uh, yesterday. When I need to resolve my deals to the sage, when I need to get the A records, my computer calls this IDNS, right? The, the name service. Um, and then when my when this IDNS name service uh, receives their request, they're going to look at my IP. They're going to look at the IP of the client. So in this case, uh, you can see that uh, I had the IP of the ARC Hotel. I was the Ar I'm at the ARC Hotel. Uh, and it is public information that that IP is being used in Linz. So uh, not every ISP does that. Most of them, like 95% of them do, do that. So uh, ISPs tend to uh, uh, 
have their IPs updated correctly with the geolocation of whoever is using that IP. So if that IP is allocated to Linux, it's going to show Linux. Allocated to, to VM, it's going to show VM. Yeah, so um, then our enemy savers are going to troll. We're going to get that IP, the information from, from IP. You can see that there's a, geo, there's a latitude and longitude there. And they're going to uh, give the information to a geo proximity calculator. Uh, and a geo proximity calculator is nothing but a, a, a simple query, a simple, a simple special query that uh, checks which of the healthy now regions is closest to the user. It's closer, it's closer to, the, uh, to the IP that is making this request. And, re, uh, and, and then it's going to figure very quickly very quickly, that the closest region to, to Linz is uh, Zurich. So it's going to return the APs uh, for now running in Zurich. OK, so uh, there was a kind of a quick, uh, kind of a quick uh, overview of how now works, like how our, how our data standards work, how our DNS works. Uh, but what's next for us? Like what's what's coming for us? Right? What are we working on? What's the, in the future for us? So we're we're very committed to uh, to those three principles I shared in the beginning. So we're very committed to uh, to continue to make it cheaper, easier, and faster, right? Uh, by easier, I mean, for example, we're very committed to uh, create lot, lots of integrations, like. Uh, for example, if you need Redis, if you need a Redis instance, we want to help you set up a Redis Labs instance. Uh, we want to, we want to enable you to, uh, for example, do now on the command line now Redis create, and we're going to set up a Redis Labs instance for you. Same for, for example, AWS RDS if you need MySQL. Same for uh, Sentry if you need error reporting. Uh, same for Paper Tray if you need uh, custom log ingestion and so on. And we also want to have thousands of regions. Like we don't want to have uh, dozens of uh, dots on that map, like I showed earlier. We're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of those uh, those dots. So we're really investing a lot on uh, uh, expanding globally. As you saw, like we in just a few weeks, uh, in just two weeks, uh, we tripled the number of locations we have. Uh, and in our experience, uh, Kubernetes is not that good. Uh, we've hit a, a few uh, scalability issues, with, uh, uh, quite a lot of them actually. Uh, scalability issues with Kubernetes. We've, we've, we've hit a few uh, reliability issues with Kubernetes as well. So we do, not we do not believe that Kubernetes is the way to achieve thousands and thousands of locations. Uh, we don't want to run uh, an ETCD cluster in 2,000 locations on the board. We don't want to run a Kubernetes master cluster to call locations around the world. And there's also some stuff, a lot of very exciting stuff that I wish I could uh, share, but I can't. So uh, anyhow, we just, uh, uh, just, just have a lot of interesting stuff going on, R&D, and uh, future projects, future areas we're expanding to. So um, yeah, uh, that was a, a quick overview, a quick, uh, yeah, quick look at how now works, like what's behind now, how, how it works behind the scenes. So um, I hope it wasn't for everybody, but I mean, I hope you learned something new. I hope you, uh, you enjoyed it. Um, so if, you, if, you got, if you're interested, like follow me on Twitter, like follow us on Twitter. Uh, check our websites uh, if, you're, if you want to see more, how, if you want to know more how now works, if you want to use now, if you want to create an account, just check our websites. Uh, and we're also hiring. Like we're hiring for a lot of roles. We're hiring for DevOps. We're hiring for software engineers, front-end engineers, back-end engineers, sales, operations. We're hiring for everything. Like we doubled the team. We hired literally everything. We doubled the team in, uh, in two months. We doubled the team. So uh, I mean, if you're interested in, in the main issue we have, if you're interested in making uh, the product accessible to everyone, fast, cheap, easy, all that stuff, just uh, yeah, come work with us. Uh, it's a, a very exciting stuff that we do. And uh, yeah, that's all. That's all I had to talk. That's all I had to say today. So if you have any questions, uh, if you like, if you don't know more, I'll be around until later. Just uh, just come find me, and I'll be around. I can ask anything. I can answer anything. Uh, thank you.